All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, we're now in Chapter 7. It's about Newton's third law, and it's a mostly um, qualitative uh, chapter. So I would like that's why you see me here doing the slides. Uh, chapter 8 is where we actually do uh, a lot of problem solving. So Chapter 7 is fairly um, conceptual, and there aren't many calculations, but it's a very important chapter. Um, we try now to... In chapters five and six, we talked about Newton's laws, mainly the first and second law. And we just talked about forces, but now in chapter uh, seven, it tells you how uh, we talk, in the previous ones, we talked about how forces um, um, change the motion of an object. And we just isolated an object alone. But now in chapter seven, Newton's third law says, you can't just have a force on an object. Forces always come in pairs. So you cannot just have a one single force. Forces always come in pairs. Okay. And so let's walk through the, these slides. So we'll talk about Newton's third law here and how objects interact. So the first question, it says, um, uh, what is an interaction? So the interaction just from the book's definition, it's the mutual uh, influence of two objects on each other. I'm just reading it through. So it's the mutual influence of two objects on each other, okay? And all forces um, are interactions. So an object cannot apply a force on another object without interacting with it. So for example, the earth pulls down this pan down so the earth pulls it down. So the earth is interacting with this pan. And so the pan is also interacting with the earth. Okay. And forces always come as action reaction uh, pairs. They, it, they always come uh, in pairs. You cannot just have a force by itself. Let me try to make this screen here uh, as full screen. And actually, I forget how to do it on. Uh, um, let me see. That I mean, it should be somewhere in the second. That's fine. We'll just work with it with a smaller screen. Okay. So we continue. Uh, you have an inter what's called an interaction diagram. So you can consider your system whatever you're interested in. So for example, here your system is these two objects. You wish to study objects A and B. So object A could be applying a force on B. They could be interacting, and object B will, could be interacting with uh, uh, with A. So they're applying a force on each other. But these forces are called internal forces. If you want to study A and B this as a system, then you consider the forces on A and B as a system, the external forces. So, so for example, again, back to my pen. The pen consists of many, 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 many atoms. So the atoms that consist, that make up the pen, they're interacting with each other. But the forces on those, between those atoms, they are internal. So we just ignore them because uh, we're interested in the pen as a whole. So we just consider the external forces on the pen. That's what Newton's second law wants. You find the net force on an object, not within an object, on an object, external to the object. And that's equal to the mass times the acceleration of that object. Um, we also talk about uh, how to model ropes and pulleys. Uh, our pulleys will always be, so for example, here you have object A is connected to object B by a string and the string goes around the pulley. So object B will fall, object A will move, and we say they are constrained to move with the same acceleration because every time object A advances by, let's say an inch, object B also has to advance by, by an inch. And so they will always have the same displacement, so for uh, or the magnitude of displacement at least. So if this one moves to the right by one centimeter, object B has to fall by one centimeter because the length of the string will not change. We consider ideal strings, meaning the rope or the string is uh, is does not extend, doesn't get any longer, and it's massless. The pulleys also will be massless and frictionless. Um, in, uh, 
Sometimes when we do a rotation, a rotation motion, we talk about the moment of inertia, the pulleys will have mass and then they will have uh, rotational inertia. But for now, the pulleys are massless and the ropes are massless and they cannot extend and they are frictionless also, the pulleys. Okay. And so as a consequence of that, if object A advances, object v, B falls. Let's say for object A, we consider this direction here to be the positive x direction. In object B, we can choose a coordinate system for object B. Let's say this is the positive x direction, the downward for object B. Then object A and B will have the same displacement. And if they have the same displacement as a function of time, they will have the same velocity because velocity will be the derivative of that. And object A and B will also have the same acceleration consequently because it's the derivative of the position, of the velocity. And one way to say it, again, if object A, first of all, object B cannot be moving faster than object A, because if you say object B is moving faster, you're saying the string is getting longer, which is not allowed. If you say object A is moving faster than B, then object A, uh, then the string will be getting shorter. It will shrink and it will be loose and it will long, no longer have tension in it. And so they have to have the same velocity. And they also have to have the same acceleration because if, Again, if B has higher acceleration, eventually B will have higher velocity than A, or if, and vice versa. If A has higher acceleration, eventually it will have higher velocity, which means either, either the string is broken or it has no tension. Um, so they say here, what is Newton's third law? So it says Newton's third law governs interactions. Every force is a member of an action-reaction pair. Again, forces come from interactions. Objects have to interact. And when they interact, you have the action of one object and then the reaction of the other object to it. And they always come in pairs. Um, the two members of this pair force always uh, act on different objects. So for example, here they have the thrust from this rocket. The, th the rocket exerts a force on the gases the gases are, uh, are pushed back, and so the gases will push on the rocket forward. If I push on the wall, then the wall will push back on me. I have, when I push on the wall, I have, I'm interacting with the wall, and so the wall will apply a normal force on me, and it will apply a normal force on the wall. That's the action-reaction pair. So my force is on the wall, and the force's wall is on me. They are interact. They are pushing on two different objects. Okay, these two forces are always equal in magnitude, and they are opposite in direction. And then it says here, how is Newton's third law used? I feel like I should probably read Newton's third law uh, verbatim from one of the translations. It says so. Here is a translation of it: To every action, there is always opposed. <laughs> an equal reaction, or the mutual action of two bodies upon each other are always equal and directed to contrary parts. Whatever draws or presses another is as much drawn or pressed by the other. If you press on a stone with your finger, the finger is also pressed by the stone. Okay? So the last sentence here uh, is to uh, give you an example. So again, to every action, there is always opposed an equal reaction. And then or, this is important, the or, after the or. The mutual action between two bodies, so there is action between two bodies, it's, and it's mutual, between two bodies upon each other is always equal and directed in contrary parts. So again, back to the wall. If you push on the wall, your force is, let's say here is the wall. I push on the wall. My force is this way. The wall's force is this way. So they are always opposite. And we're told they are equal also in magnitude. And they always come in pairs. Okay. Um, so they go here about Newton's, uh, how to use Newton's third law. So it, it, it depends. Uh, so it says you draw a free body diagram of each object. You, you show the action reaction pairs. And then if you're interested in the two objects as a whole, then that force is internal and it doesn't matter. If you want to separate the two objects, then you just consider the two, uh, each object separately. And so the force on one object 
is equal to, uh, due to one to the other object is equal to the force on the other object due to that first object. So in here they have a war, a hand in the ground. So you have the force by your hand on the ground is equal to the force of the ground on your hand. Now, uh, why is again Newton's third law important? Well, it's important because it tells us that the origin of forces that they come from interactions. Okay, they come from they come from interactions, and it quantifies them. It says they are equal, and it also gives us the direction of those forces that they are equal and opposite in direction. So if you're hitting again a hammer, they have a lot of examples here, so I'll just go quicker on it. A hammer hits a wall, then the wall hits uh, a hammer hits a nail, and so the nail also hits the the hammer with equal and exactly the same force. And uh, it says, if you don't believe it, imagine hitting the nail with a glass hammer. Um, and so a, a conceptual example is, it doesn't mean that they will, uh, they will experience the same force, but it doesn't mean that they will experience the same acceleration. We will show one example for a, uh, an object, uh, objects, uh, the pull of gravity on an object and the pull of that object on Earth. And uh, we will see that they're equal, but it doesn't mean they experience the same acceleration. Or a huge uh, truck collides with a small car, and uh, both of them experience the same force. The effect, the, it, the force is the same. The effect does not have to be the same. The effect, which is the acceleration, that depends on the mass, because the acceleration is the force over the mass. So we didn't say that the accelerations would be the same. We said the forces would be, would be the same. Okay, continue. Um, so again, you have action-reaction pairs. A bat hits a ball, the ball will also hit the bat with exactly the same force, and it, but in different direction. They are called action-reaction pairs. Okay, um, again, two blocks here. Block A exerts a force on block B, then block B exerts a force on block A. Equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. Where did that force come from? It came from the interaction between these two objects. And uh, in the previous chapters, we only talked about objects that are isolated. We never talked about, so this object, for example, object A is experience of for force F1, and it's experiencing a force F2, and it's experience of force F3. It experiences a force F1 because it's interacting with another object called object one. It's experiencing a force F2 because it's interacting with another object called object two, and it's experiencing a force F3 due to an interaction with another object, object three. To apply Newton's second law, this is all we care about. Now, where did this force come from? Again, they come from, where did these forces come from? They come from interactions. So if you care about now, if I say, what's the force on object one that had applied the force F1 on object A, we say the force on object one due to object A is also F1, but in the opposite direction. And similarly for object two, and similarly for object three. They're always in opposite directions. Okay. Um, so again, you get interactions and it just, um, what, it, what system do you consider you're interested in? Uh, what what, your, what is the system that you're interested in? And then you can apply Newton's second law. So again, Newton's second law is the law that pretty much we apply to figure out the motion of an object, but uh, to figure out the uh, uh, where did the forces come from and so on, that's what the Newton's third law tries to answer for us. And it's actually important when we use conservation of momentum. The whole conservation of momentum comes from the fact that Newton's third law holds. Okay, um, let's continue uh, on this. Again, we talked about this internal, external forces, and I want to uh, go on. Uh, this is just problem solving tactics. Um, the best way to learn to solve problems is not to read these tactics. I mean, that's fine, you can read them, uh, but at the end, you have to uh, actually do the problems, uh, to experience doing problems. So here is this figure here. It says, you got a person pushing on a large crate across a rough surface. 
and it says identify all the interactions, show them on an interaction diagram, and then draw a free body diagram of the person and the crate. So you got a person on top of the ground, and then you got a crate also on top of the ground. So there is the interaction between the person and the crate. There is the interaction between the person and the ground, and then the person and the, uh, and the earth also. So there will be friction due to the ground. There is the pull of gravity due to the ground, and, uh, and then the person pushing on the crate and the crate also experiences friction from the ground, would be in the parallel to the motion if there is any. And then there is uh, uh, the force of gravity on the crate. So there are all of these, uh, all of these uh, forces. Okay. So if you consider the person, for example, here is the person, um, and then uh, the person experiences a force from the crate because the person pushes the crate, the crate pushes back on the person. The person experiences a force from the ground and that force from the ground, you get the frictional force and then you get the force of gravity on the, on the person, okay? Or the, the frictional force from the surface itself, S, surface, and then the, from the earth or the entire earth, E, E, the entire earth. Now, which ones are Newton's law, Newton's third law pairs? Which one are pairs, action, reaction? Well, the per let me go back here. The person pushes on the crate, the crate pushes back on the person. That's a Newton's third law pair. The person is standing on the ground. Now, the force of friction due to the surface on the person, and then the force of friction due to the person on the surface, that's a Newton's third law pair. The earth pulls on the person downward, the, the person pulls on the earth upward, that's a Newton's third law pair. Similarly for the crate you got gravity is trying to pull down on the crate. The crate will try to pull up on the earth. That's a Newton's third law uh, pair. Person pushes the crate, the crate pushes back on the person. That's a Newton's third law pair. Now, crate wants to move on the ground, uh, on the surface. The surface opposes the motion of the crate, so it will apply a force of friction on the crate to the left, let's say, if the crate is moving to the right. Therefore, the crate here will apply a force of friction on the surface that will be to the right because the force of the surface on the crate was to the left due to the friction. There will be a frictional force on the surface due to the crate and it will be directed to the right. Okay. And if you want to talk about just the person by themselves, then the person will experience a force in the, upper, uh, in, uh, 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 the normal force from the ground and then there is the force of the, the pull of gravity from the ground and then there is the the person pushes on the uh, on the on the crate and therefore the the crate will uh, will push back on the on the on the on the person and then there is the force of friction due to the surface on the person similarly for the crate okay now how do we walk the way we walk uh, like they call it propulsion uh, it, so it's less fancy here, the way you walk. If you observe, try to walk, you will see that you're pushing on the ground. Let's say you want, you want to walk to the right. You're actually pushing backward here to the left on the ground. And so the ground pushes you forward. And that's what makes you move in the forward direction. It's due to the static friction because you're not skidding or sliding. You're temporarily uh, at the instant your foot is on the ground. It's actually static friction. You're not uh, sliding. If you're standing on a frictionless surface, completely frictionless, you will not be able to walk forward if it's completely frictionless. Because you try to push backward, but you're pushing on nothing because there is no static friction. Um, examples of propulsion, you got the thrust, you push gases uh, backward and the gases will push you up. In the case of the car, you might think it's the engine that's pushing the car forward that's partly true because the engine tries to spin the wheels. The wheels are interacting with the ground and then the wheels push back on the ground. So the ground pushes forward on them and that's the static friction. I mean, if you're in a completely frictionless surface, just raise the car. You can apply all the torque you want and uh, push the gas pedal to the floor. If the car is up, the wheels will be spinning, but you don't move anywhere because you're not on the ground. 
there is no friction. If you're just in the air, the wheels will just spin freely, but you don't move anywhere. You don't go uh, forward. Okay. So now, uh, again, Newton's third law, it says every force occurs as one member of an action reaction pair. So forces don't just exist by themselves. You have to have two of them, either two or nothing. The, the two, uh, the two members of an action reaction pair, they act on two different objects. And then the two members of an action reaction pair, they're equal in magnitude, they're opposite in direction. And they're symbolized this way. The force on, uh, the force on, uh, A, uh, th this is the force on, uh, on B due to A, A on B, um, is equal to the force on, uh, of B on A, but it's there is a minus sign meaning in the opposite direction. So here you have uh, gravity. The Earth pulls down an object. The force of gravity when you're near the surface of of the Earth, it's downward and it's equal to mg. That's your weight. Now if the Earth applies a force of mg on you, guess what? Newton's third law says you apply a force that's equal to it on the Earth, which is equal to mg also but it's in the upward direction. So the force of Earth on a ball is equal to negative mg, the mass of the ball times gravity, and it's in the downward direction. Therefore, the force of the, uh, of the ball on the Earth will be in the upward direction, and it's also equal to mg. So the acceleration will be the force on Earth, the force of, of the ball, uh, the the force of the ball the, the the acceleration of the earth will be the force of the ball on earth divided by the mass of the earth the force of the ball on earth is equal to the force of the earth on the ball by newton's third law so that's the mass of the ball times gravity divided by the uh the mass of the earth and so you will find that the acceleration that the earth experiences is very very low the ball will experience a 9.8 acceleration the earth the mass of the ball over the mass of the earth is tiny, it's negligible, it's basically zero. And so you will see an acceleration of like 10 to the minus 24. So you might think about it. As the pan falls toward the earth, the earth is pulling the pan. The pan is also pulling the earth. So you think the, the pan is falling toward the earth, but the earth is also falling toward the pan, but that's negligible. You don't see the whole earth. You, you don't, it's immeasurable that the earth is going upward. First of all, time it takes is tiny, maybe one second, and the acceleration is 10 to the minus 24. It's very, very, very small. Um, and here we have the hand pushing on A and A pushing on B, and then both of them accelerate. So we can consider, if this, is, if this surface is frictionless, we can take our system to be object A by itself, object B by itself, or objects A and B combined. And uh, usually we'll take, if you want the acceleration of the entire A and B, uh, of, the, of A and B, what's their acceleration? So you're interested in A and B as just one block, and that block's mass is just the mass of A plus the mass of B. Just re redraw this as the mass of A and the mass of B uh, by themselves. Yeah, I will do an example on this, uh, on, the, on the board, when I go to the board. Okay, I will come back to this. So now, the hand pushes on A, and so A pushes back on the hand. So there is the force of the hand on object A. The force of the hand is not on object B. It's not on object B. It's not directly on object B. So the for what are the forces on object A? There is the force of the hand on object A to the right. And then object A pushes on object B. So there is the force of object B on object A to the left. There is also the normal force upward. And then there is the pull of gravity downward. What are the forces on object B? The forces on object B are the pull of gravity downward, the normal force upward, and then object A pushes on object B to the right, and object B also accelerates. That's why object B accelerates. It's because A pushes on B, not because the hand is pushing on B directly. No, the hand is pushing on A, which in turn pushes on B, and then you get the acceleration. Okay, and this is a diagram there. And um, I will talk more about these when I go to the board. I just want to get familiar with all the slides here. Um, now, uh, constrained motion. 
for example, here they have a tow truck. The tow truck is towing a car. The car has to be moving with the truck and uh, the rope is under tension. It has a fixed length, fixed tension. And so uh, actually the tension doesn't have to be fixed, but there is some tension. And so as the truck moves, the car has to follow. So whatever, if the truck moves one mile, the truck has to better be moving one mile. Otherwise it means the, the rope is cut. Don't want that. We're assuming the rope is, the car is constrained to move with the truck. If the car, if the truck is moving at 60 miles an hour, the car better will be moving at 60 miles an hour. If the truck stops, the car stops. If the truck accelerates, the car accelerates. So they're constrained to have the same acceleration and uh, the same displacement and the same, uh, uh, same uh, speeds and so on. And uh, the way the force, by having them constrained, that tells us what the force between them is. The force of constraint, it's called the force of constraint. What's making this motion happen? It's the tension here of the rope. And to figure the tension in the rope, we need to know what the constraint is. Uh, here is another constraint. They're constrained because they they're tied in a certain way and they have to move in a certain motion. For example, object A is constrained to move along the surface here, in addition to that, it's constrained to move, with, it's tied to object B. So every time object B falls, object A moves to the right. So object A has to move along this line this way, and it has to have the same acceleration as object B. Similarly, object B will only fall, so it's moving downward in the downward direction, and uh, it has to have the same acceleration as object A because they're tied. And let's go on in here. Where does the tension come from? Well, it comes from really electrostatic forces between with these two objects. It's they're, they're, at the end, they're made of atoms. And those atoms, they have forces between them. And that's where the tension force uh, comes from. You can model those atoms as springs. When you extend the spring, and they will have tension in them. And those, they say here, molecular bonds. So anyways, there will be tension here. And uh, the again, they're trying to tell you that the tension is not just some force that just exists. Uh, it's not some new force. It comes from uh, the, uh, uh, the electrostatic forces that are there. So we have those fundamental forces, right? You get the, uh, the electroweak forces, you get the strong forces, and you get the gravitational uh, the gravitational uh, force. Okay. And if a ten, if the string or the rope is um, is uh, is ideal, meaning it's massless and it doesn't stretch, um, then the tension on either ends of the rope has to be the same. And the reason for that, the rope is massless. Imagine. Let's say you got the rope here is being pulled by this person to the right and it's being pulled by this person to the left. Imagine there is a net force. Imagine there is a force and that force is, is different. Let's say this person pulls with 101 newtons this way and this person pulls with just 100. So she's winning 101 newtons this way to the right, 100, uh, 100 newtons to the left. So the net force on the rope will be one newton to the right. If the rope is massless, if the rope is massless, what would the acceleration be? Well, if it's massless, it means the mass is zero. So you would be dividing by zero to get the acceleration. So the rope would have infinite acceleration or very extremely large. And that's not allowed because if you're saying it's infinite acceleration, it better disappear from the picture. Infinite acceleration, speed, the velocity will be infinity pretty soon. And so it will disappear from the picture, but it's not. It's held on here. So since the rope is here, its acceleration, the acceleration of the rope itself uh, is, uh, uh, is, is zero. And so we conclude that the net force on the rope is also zero. It has to, if this person pulls with 100, this person has to be being uh, pulling with 100. So uh, the rope, the tension on either end of the rope has to be equal if it's ideal. Next. If the rope is being pulled by 100, what does the rope do to this person? Well, the rope has to pull on that person by 100, and it has to be pulling on this person also by 100 newtons. So the tension on the rope on either end has to be the same. 
And in order to have tension on a rope, you have to be, it has to be tied from both ends. It has to be pulled from both ends, either by two people or maybe it's tied to a wall and then being pulled from the other end. Because if it's just tied to a wall and this person is not there, then you just have a loose rope just hanging in there. It doesn't have any tension. The tension would be zero. Okay. All right, so we talked about this one. Uh, I have talked about that. And uh, let's continue uh, with this. So the tension on either end of the rope will be the same. So that's a given. Um, let's see. Yeah, so the rope is massless. Okay, let's continue with this. You can have tied objects. So if you're pulling on this object with some tension here, and then object A is tied to object B, so you can you have a different rope here, so there will be another tension here, and they will there now A and B are tied together, so and they're being pulled to the right. As A moves, B also moves, and it has to have the same velocity and acceleration because they are uh, they are being uh, uh, constrained to move together. So they say here it's a conceptual example. You have uh, objects A and B are connected by a massless string. And uh, and they are being pulled across a frictionless table and uh, by a massless string A. And it says object B has a higher mass, a larger mass is heavier than object A. And it says is the tension in string two larger than, smaller than, or equal to the tension in uh, in in string uh, in uh, in 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 string one and the answer is, the question is well what do you think well let's let's look at the two um uh, the, the this is a conceptual uh, example and so it says object b has a uh, a larger mass so it may be tempting to conclude that string two which pulls object b has a greater tension than string one which pulls on uh did I say spring? String. String one which pulls an A. And then it says the flow of reasoning is that Newton's second law tells us uh, only about the net force. The net force on object B is larger than the net force on object A, but the net force on object A is not just tension one. It is uh, it's not just tension one uh, uh, forward. There is also tension two uh, backward. Uh, there is also uh, tension to uh, in the backward direction. So again, if you want these two objects to accelerate, you can combine them as just one object. Again, I'll come back to this on the board. It's easier to explain than just pointing with my uh, with the mouse here. So I, I would come back to uh, to this one. Yeah, I think it should just come back to it. Um, all right, let's see. Um, uh, yeah, let, let, let me come back to that one. All right, so compa comparing the two tensions, uh, let's continue uh, with this. Again, we will do object uh, examples on the pulleys where we have to choose our coordinates, coordinate systems. Um, one thing is the coordinate system for A does not have to be the same coordinate system for B. For A, you could choose the x direction to be to the right. For B, you can choose your x direction to be downward, or you can use the same coordinate system if you like. It's uh, totally up to you. Um, we will continue, and then it says here, working with ropes, you can have example problems. The best way, again, to learn it is to, uh, is to, um, is to do examples. So come back to this. Um, and then they have the summary slides here. So again, to summarize Newton's third law, it's the you, forces come from interactions, right? So you have interactions, they have forces, and then forces, they change the motion of an object. Okay, and you have the action, reaction, they always come in pairs, they come from interactions, they act on two, on two separate objects, and they come from, uh, and, they, and they have the same magnitude opposite in direction. Uh, skip through this one. And, uh, and then when you're considering different objects, make sure you, you know exactly what your system is. Um, and then 
what it interacts with and whether the forces are internal or external. Okay. And we talked about constrained objects that are constrained to have the same acceleration. And, let's, and that's about it. All right, so now I'll go back to the board.